This program has been made possible by generous gifts from our friends of Cross the Bridge. Thank you for your support. Just failure is not an option. Paul has started the church, obviously called to lead the church, but other folks are coming in trying to lead people astray and away simply because they want them to follow them instead of following Paul. And that's kind of a timeless thing, happens over and over and over and over again of church splits and people trying to go do their own thing with people that were already in an existing church. And as we look at this battle and think about this, it reminds me of a story. There was a Scottish leader Robert the Bruce. If you've ever seen Braveheart, you saw him in that movie uh, making some political mistakes, but he was after William Wallace, and he made a very strange request that when he died, that the next leader would take a portion of his heart and, and put it in a leather sack and wear it around his neck into the battles because he wanted to be a part of the battles even after he was gone. Well, the Scots were kind of known for their fighting in an unconnected statement, I have Scottish blood. And so they got in a skirmish where they were vastly outnumbered. There was about 30 Scots and hundreds of Englishmen. And the man who was carrying the heart of Robert the Bruce did an interesting thing. Instead of surrendering, he snatched the leather pouch off his neck and he tossed it over the heads of the Englishmen. And then he turned to the guys he was standing with and said, now, fight for the heart of your king. You know what, in life sometimes we have skirmishes. Sometimes we may even feel like we're outnumbered. We may even think what we're facing is impossible. And yet, we're told very clearly in the Bible that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Meaning that if God brings you to a battle, he has the strength to equip you to bring you through it victoriously. And remember that in those moments when maybe you're weak, maybe it looks bad, looks dark, that phrase, fight for the heart of your king. In 2 Corinthians, we'll go back to verse 1 and just kind of read through. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1 says, Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ who in presence am lowly among you, who, but being absent am bold towards you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. 
excuse me, for the weapons, verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now, we went over those four verses last week, and that, that teaching's online, and so it brings us to verse 5, which is a very important verse, not only in this chapter, but really in this whole book. And it gives us a lot of keys about the battle. Let's read verse 5. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, before we dig into that verse in particular, let me make a statement because I don't want you hearing about battles and skirmishes and asking the question, well, what if I lose? Well, in a technical sense, some of the battles, you will lose in the sense that you won't always do the right thing. You're probably already painfully aware of that and don't need me to tell you that. But even, friend, when we lose a skirmish, Something good can come out of it. We can win. We can have a win even through a loss. One great thing that happens whenever you mess up is you have a fresh appreciation of the grace of God. You also are less judgmental of those around you coming freshly off of a mistake, aren't you? When things are going well, you're tempted to look down your nose at people. You're tempted to throw your head back so high that if it had rained, you'd drown. <laughs> but when you mess up, ah, then you have compassion and grace for people. And let's understand that Jesus is the warrior that we're all leaning on, He's our leader. He's our real commander-in-chief. No offense against anybody who's in or ever been in Washington. I'll have many presidents, but I will only have one king, and his name is Jesus. Amen. I probably just got put back on some list or something. But Jesus says this. When he was talking to the disciples, and, and I call it the real Lord's Prayer. We have that little, you know, section that we call the Lord's Prayer. But that was Jesus teaching them how to pray. When Jesus was praying, it's a great section to read, John 16, 17. Jesus is getting ready to be beaten. He's getting ready to be crucified, betrayed all these things, and yet he turns to the disciples and says, let not your heart be troubled. It's a great model. See, we can get caught up in our own little world and our own little skirmishes and stuff. Be careful about doing that. Jesus, in his hour of need, focused on others. And he said this in John 17, 12. He said, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. So when Jesus has you, friend, Jesus has you. It's not like you can slip out of his hands or slip through his fingers. And while we battle, we battle while we stand right in the palm of his nail-scarred hand. 
Now, that doesn't mean that we don't fight or shouldn't fight or shouldn't be vigilant. The Bible takes great care to talk about this battle, great care to talk about the skirmishes and the things that go on. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because the adversary, because a adversary, because some adversary, no, because your adversary. You have an adversary. It's not me. It's not your spouse. You may think it is some days, but it's not. Your adversary is the enemy of your soul, the accuser of the brethren. He goes by the name of the devil, and he's real. Now, you don't have to spend a lot of time and a lot of focus on him. You don't need to know a lot about him, but know what the Word says about him. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Notice it says seeking whom he may devour. Don't say he devours everybody. He's seeking whom he may devour. I've shared this before, but part of what happens in a believer's life is somebody can be in a group of people and then they get offended or they get their feelings hurt or they don't agree with something that happens or happens in the church. Think about that. Think if, you tra- think if you treated your workplace like you look at the church and you went in on Monday and then somebody didn't fold a piece of paper the way that you thought it should be folded and you said, you know what? I know I've been here 15 years, but I'm out of here. She folded that piece of paper so wrong, I quit. I'm out of here. I'm offended. Or you walked into the office and don't look at me like that. You know what? I'm out of here. But sometimes people treat churches like that. And when you stir up that spiritual battle, it, 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 man, makes for a strange place. The reason I say that, because this verse is seeking whom he may devour. Who does a lion devour? He focuses on the one zebra or gazelle or whatever that's away from the group. There really is safety in a fellowship, safety in a group. You get out on your own, by yourself spiritually, you can be vulnerable. And so that's why it's good. That's why the Word of God says to dwell together in fellowship. And also let's realize it says like a roaring lion. It's another great picture to understand that the enemy, like a roaring lion, do you realize that the lion, the male lion, is not really the big hunter? That's not his job. His job is simply to roar and get the other animals freaked out and running. Because once they start running from him, They're running to the lionesses that are around the perimeter where they'll be caught and devoured. But see, if the lion roars and the animal doesn't run or take off, he's actually in a safe place. It's a great spiritual lesson because sometimes the the enemy of your soul, the adversary, he roars, oh, this, oh, that, oh, look at this, oh, look at that. Oh, what's wrong with you and what's wrong with them? And if you listen to that, you're going to run off right into the waiting jaws of those who are after you. We read about it online, watch it on television, and hear about it on the radio. Our world is filled with violence and fear. Whether it's threats of terrorism around the world or senseless violence in our own backyard, our world is clearly broken and in need of hope. That's why this month only, Cross the Bridge Ministries is offering Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism. This special presentation from David McGee was filmed on the anniversary of 9-11 and is a message of hope and victory. This insightful teaching also exposes the truth about Islam's dangerous past 
while rejoicing in God's plan for our future. Join David McGee as he helps you and your loved ones to walk in peace and not be afraid of what the future holds. The product Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism is our gift to you for a donation of any amount to Cross the Bridge Ministries. Call today to receive your copy of Know Your Future by dialing 877-458-5508 or visit us online at crossthebridge.com. Instead of letting the peace that passes all understanding rule in your hearts. It's a very deep verse, 1 Peter 5, 8. And what does the enemy want from you? Well, we're told. We're told he's the accuser of the brethren. So he wants to accuse you. And let me say this, because I struggled with something early on when I was a young Christian. I had done some things that are really painfully regretted. One series of events, I, every time I asked God to forgive me, I'd keep bringing that up. You know. God, forgive me of this again. And one day when I was in prayer, the Lord said, was it not enough? And that still small voice, and I said, what? He said, was it not enough? I said, was, was what not enough? He said, apparently, my blood and my death were enough to cover most of your sins. But was my blood and my death not enough to cover those sins you keep bringing up? It really cut me to the heart. Because I realized I wasn't trusting in his forgiveness. And that day I accepted his forgiveness for those things and I never mentioned them again. If you think you're being spiritual by asking forgiveness for the same sins over and over, you're not. Now, if you're committing the same sins over and over, yes, ask God to forgive you repeatedly and break out of that cycle. But if you're asking him over and over to forgive you of something you did long ago in your past, it's not God who's bringing that up to you. It's the accuser of the brethren. Let's apply that to our relationships. Do you bring up somebody's mistakes to them over and 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 over, and over again? That's not like Jesus. That's more like the enemy. Now, I know that sometimes it's really tempting to bring those things up. I understand that. I'm a person. I'm a human. I'm married. I got kids and all, you know, all that stuff. I felt so sorry years ago for this woman that she was in her driveway and she accidentally left her car in drive and went to get the paper in front of the car and the car moved and ran her over. Didn't hurt her, but it ran her over. The reason I felt so bad for her is not because the car hit her, because I realized that she never again won an argument with her husband. <laughs> because sooner or later in that discussion was going to be, oh, yeah, well, you, honey, remember the time you were out and you didn't call me and you were late and you remember this and you, you didn't do this and you didn't, it, it all come down to the husband going, yeah, well, what about the time you ran yourself over? <laughs> but see, we shouldn't bring up people's mistakes over and over again. But we do. You know what's interesting? If you look in your Bible at the Gospel of John chapter 8, almost all our Bibles have the same heading, the adulterous woman. How interesting that we've decided to label that woman for 2,000 years the adulterous woman, forgetting the words of Jesus in that very chapter where he says, who condemns you? And she says, no one, Lord. And he says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. And then somebody that was subdividing the chapters put the adulterous woman. Be careful of those labels. John chapter 10, verse 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. 
That's a great picture of the battle going on. The thief, your enemy, your adversary wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus wants to give you life and life more abundantly. It's very clear cut. Makes it very difficult to figure out who to follow, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. So obvious, you follow Jesus who wants to give you life and life more abundantly. And it tells us part of that struggle going on is the struggle for life itself. The enemy wants to take your life completely. But he also wants to rob it of, of joy, of love, of beauty and grace. You realize it's the enemy when we slip into this same old, same old mode? That's something that brings you joy. Maybe, maybe it's great joy for you to sit in the morning with a hot cup of tea or a hot cup of coffee and sit with your Bible. And it brings you great joy. Life, abundant. But the enemy can be subtly at work to where all of a sudden that's a hassle that you don't have time for. That's the enemy at work. Something that you find life in that he wants to twist. Back to this verse. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. There's something interesting about this verse. Now, let's remember the verse before says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're spiritual. Let's go through this verse and underline a couple of words. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Or if we look into the King James Version of this verse... Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Look at those three words. Imaginations, knowledge, thought. Let me ask you a question. Where do you think this battle's taking place? Between your ears. That's where the big battle is. Now, maybe some of you think it's uh, with your neighbor, with your spouse, with your kids, with your parents. Maybe you think it's with, it, within your body that your body wants to do things. There's maybe a little truth in that last one. But it's your mind. It's your mind that will think, man, I, 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 man, I, hadn't, I hadn't drank in a while. I, I, I'd really like to go have a drink. And, and then, and then I, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to go in. I'm just going to drive past the bar. And then, oh, wait a minute. Is that Joe's car? I'm just going to drive in. See, it, it's here. It's here. This is where we plan out our sin long before we commit it. Or it's where we stop it. It's not a sin to have some weird, strange thought. That's part of the attack. Understand that. If you've ever been sitting in here worshiping the Lord or sitting here listening to a teaching and all of a sudden you get some weird image or some weird thought or something like that and you think, what in the world is that? That's not from this world. That's from the pit of hell. Because he'll flash things from you. And that's why you got to be careful about what you see and what you listen to. Because he'll bring up that little file folder at the weirdest of times. So the battle is taking place in our mind. That's the first life lesson here. Most of our spiritual battles take place in our mind. This is part of why... Reading the Bible, studying the Bible, 
learning about the Bible is so important because you're renewing your mind. When we went to school, they taught us about different things, but they didn't teach us some of the, really, some of the more important things. They didn't teach us about God unless you went to a Christian school. Didn't teach us about the love of God, the forgiveness of God, how to tithe, how to serve, how to be born again, about this spiritual battle. Now, these are things that we learn in studying the Bible. These are things that we learn in doing the Bible. And that's why what we do here at the bridge is so unique and so important, teaching the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Some of you have been carrying stuff for years, and it's weighing you down and ripping you off, stealing your joy and your peace. You've held it for too long, and it's like a rattlesnake that's hitting you with poison. Put it down. Sit it down and leave it. And pray with me right now, out loud. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me so I could be forgiven. And I believe you were raised from the dead so I could have a new life. And I've done wrong things. And I am sorry. Please forgive me of all those things. Please give me your spirit and your power to follow you all my life. In Jesus' name. If you've prayed this prayer with Pastor David, receiving Jesus Christ for the first time, or rededicating your life to the Lord, please call and let us know. We want to send you our exclusive First Steps package for free. This package will help you grow in your new life. Receive your First Steps package by calling 877-458-5508. That's 877-458-5508. Or visit us online at crossthebridge.com. We read about it online, watch it on television, and hear about it on the radio. Our world is filled with violence and fear. Whether it's threats of terrorism around the world or senseless violence in our own backyard, our world is clearly broken and in need of hope. That's why this month only, Cross the Bridge Ministries is offering Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism. This special presentation from David McGee was filmed on the anniversary of 9-11 and is a message of hope and victory. This insightful teaching also exposes the truth about Islam's dangerous past while rejoicing in God's plan for our future. Join David McGee as he helps you and your loved ones to walk in peace and not be afraid of what the future holds. The product Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism is our gift to you for a donation of any amount to Cross the Bridge Ministries. Call today to receive your copy of Know Your Future by dialing 877-458-5508 or visit us online at crossthebridge.com.